Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, my name is Vanessa July, and I'm a cloud customer engineer for higher education at Google. Uh, that means that I work with customers like yourselves um, on applications that touch the student body, the staff at an institution, and, and even sometimes in use cases like distance learning and online learning. Um, so today, you'll hear from a little bit from me on what Google's vision for an AI-first institution looks like. We'll talk, most of the time actually, you'll be hearing from people just like yourselves at institutions who have implemented some of this technology uh, and what that was like, what that experience was like for them uh, and, and some of the use cases that came out of that and potentially even some of the roadmap opportunities that exist for those institutions. <clears throat> so I think a lot of us here know that uh, the path for a student from perspective all the way to uh, an employed uh, professional is not one step. Uh, and so Google really took this to heart and we think of it and translate it into a student life cycle. And what that means is there are so many places along a student journey that we can interject with technology and we think about how we can use technology to, to enrich that experience. Um, this is much more than what you see on the screen here, but we're going to focus uh, on steps two and, and a little bit more on step four. When you have a student that is at your university, how do you help them and how do you deploy an agent and, and not just use ML as a buzzword, how do you actually interject that into the student life cycle to help that student as they work through your university? <clears throat> and so what you'll see is dialogue flow is really the agent that enables this. Uh, very simply, Dialogflow is a conversation building tool. Uh, and, and it does so in a very powerful way by using natural language processing uh, to take the way that a student or a professor or teacher or someone would speak naturally and translate that into something that you might have heard before called intense. Uh, and, and you can think of that by imagining all the different ways that someone might ask about the weather. <clears throat> so, you know, you can say, how hot is it today? Um, will it rain today? What's the temperature going to be like this week? Uh, and traditionally, it may have been very uh, rigid and difficult for people to interact with an agent because it required a very specific input. And it's also very difficult for developers to create that agent by hard coding very rigid language and context into that agent. And so what Dialogflow does is remove that meaning that your user, your student, your staff member can interact the way that we talk very naturally and all of the natural language processing that is built into Dialogflow translates that for you into something actionable in your bot. <clears throat> and so today, you're going to hear from three different institutions on how they've implemented a lot of this technology uh, and how they were able to build faster, to inter iterate, to, to bring in student input and focus group input to deploy something very quickly. You'll hear about how the integrations that Dialogflow presents to you allows you to meet your student and to meet your staff member where they are. So this means they can interact on their phones, they can interact in the LMS, in the LRS, they can interact in the student portal, how they're used to interacting. And you'll hear about how when you're able to meet your students and your staff where they are and how they want to interact, how that really helps you um, to maximize those investments, not just in technology, but also in the information that you're able to collect and then give back to your user base. And so with that, I'm going to bring Greg Reynolds up to the stage to tell you about how they've done that at Case Western. Thank you, Vanessa. Hello. Uh, my name is Gregory Reynolds. I'm an application developer at Case Western Reserve University. And for those of you that don't know, Case Western Reserve University is a mid-sized research institution with uh, lots of undergrad and grad students that all kind of intertwine. And like all universities, we have a vast amount of information for our students to consume. And our job as technologists is to bring that information closer to the students. This saves them time so they can focus on their learning. One of the ways that we're doing that is through our chatbot, Spartan Answers. 
Spartan Answers is built on the technology of Google Assistant using Dialogflow infused with our information. So the project to create Spartan Answers was a very unique project for us. Uh, it wasn't a top-down approach like most projects. Uh, right before the second quarter of 2018, our CIO asked us, uh, those of us in university technology, that we had interest in chatbot technologies, uh, to just self-group. So we did, and we had a really good group of people that decided, let's talk about this, let's figure it out, and we had our own roadmap, we figured out our own audience and uh, direction to move, and we're really excited about what happened. Um, so that all started around uh, the first part of second quarter 2018. And within about a month, one of our developers found some code on GitHub, wrote a web application using AWS and Amazon Lex, uh, which worked well as a, as a prototype. But it didn't allow us to integrate as quickly as we wanted to with our services. And it also didn't work really well on mobile devices. So we knew we had some work to do. So fast forward to July, uh, last Cloud Next, uh, I met Vanessa and we started talking about what uh, Case Western could benefit with Google and Google technologies. And then in August, Google released Google Assistant to G Suite for Education, which opened the doors for us to use Google Assistant for our chatbot. So I started exploring uh, how to use that and Within a couple days, I had feature parity with our original prototype. And then a couple more days after that, I was able to integrate with our location information and our campus events information really easily. This also allowed us to have easy access on mobile devices because Google Assistant already has an Android and an iOS app. So we were very excited about that, and we decided to switch uh, our platforms to Google Assistant and Dialogflow because of that prototype. So in quarter four of 2018, we started demoing that project to uh, the different faculty and staff and our students, and the student focus groups gave us a really great idea that we were on the right track, but they also helped us build our roadmap for the future. Um, and then in February, we released our product to Pilot. And we, we, it's been very well received and we're very excited about it. So I wanna talk briefly about where we're at, uh, how we built it, and where we're going next. So to explain where we're at, I want you to imagine that you are a first time student. Uh, you're stepping foot on Case Western's campus for the first time. Uh, it's August, uh, the weather's really nice in Cleveland, Ohio at that time. So what is the first question you as a first time student might ask? Well, I know you, most first, students, first time students would ask, how do I connect to Wi-Fi? So you pull up Spartan Answers and you ask it, how do I connect to Wi-Fi? And if you see on the screen, uh, it brings up a nice chat interface in a chat bubble, it tells you uh, that it found the following information, and then it uses the material design di uh, card view, which also allows for a link that you can click through for more information. So you know how to get on Wi-Fi, so you turn on Wi-Fi, and you're like, okay, I need to buy my books. So you ask, where's the bookstore? So it shows a location, a, a link to Google Maps for navigation, it shows the building title and picture so you know exactly where you're going. Uh, and third, uh, you might wanna know what's happening this weekend, so you ask that. And sure enough, it shows a list of the events happening this weekend so you can enjoy time with your friends before classes start. So uh, with that, uh, I wanna move into how we built it. And I know a, this might be a little technical for some people, but don't worry, there, there's a lot of pieces that uh, you don't need to be a developer to understand, and I, I'll walk through those. Uh, as Vanessa mentioned, uh, Dialogflow uses a term called intents, which is just a question and answer set, so, the, so Dialogflow's machine learning can understand what to respond to a certain question. 
But to get it to respond with the machine learning, you have to train it. And the way you train it is by giving various types of questions, uh, various types of ways to ask the question so it can run its machine learning training on that. And so you see on the screen, uh, it says, you know, how do I connect to Wi-Fi? Is there Wi-Fi on campus? And the third one, does CWRU have Wi-Fi? And I wanted to point out the highlight in yellow that uh, CWRU is one of the many ways that you can say Case Western Reserve University. And so it is tagged as a university intent, or a university entity, which allows for synonyms. So this is how we got around that, so we didn't have to train for each type of way you could ask, you know, how do you get to Case Western or whatever. So once you have it trained, you have to tell it how to respond. And if you remember back to the Wi-Fi question, we, we had the little chat bubble that said, I found the following information. So in the simple response on the left, that's, what's, that's where you input that information. And then in the simple response on the right, this is the audio response that Google Assistant gives. Um, and then in the basic card, this is where it shows the material design card layout with a link. And that's all it takes to do one question and answer intent. It's super easy and fast, which is why we really like Dialogflow. Now I have one more example for you, and that's the location question, where is the bookstore? So you'll see that it's the same type of training, and there's a lot of words highlighted in orange here. Now instead of using the synonym approach with entities, we're using multiple locations as an entity so we can train one question, uh, one intent, with all of our locations. And we didn't have to input every building into Dialogflow. So it makes it really easy once we have a new uh, building come online, which we will here in the next few months with our health edu education, education campus, uh, once it's inputted in the Campus Maps database, it will be live right in the chatbot, which we're really excited about that integration. Now, to do the response for a question like this, it's much different. It's a programmatic way. Uh, you start with Dialogflow, which is what we've been talking about, but the blue box in the middle is our webhook. And a webhook is simply a program that you write that sits in between Dialogflow and other services. And in the red box, the service API, uh, for the location information question, that's the Campus Maps database API, but we also use it for Google Calendar. Uh, it can be any type of service. Uh, so once uh, Dialogflow gets the question, it sends that question to the webhook with the intent name and with the parameters. So in the case of where is the bookstore, it sends the map intent with the bookstore as a location. So it knows to, the webhook knows to talk to the Google Maps database, um, and the Google Maps database looks up information about the bookstore and passes it on back to the webhook, which then packages it up in a way that Dialogflow can understand. So that is how easy it is to do both of the types of questions. One that is just simple, you give it the answer, and the other that it looks up in different applications. Um, so with that, uh, where are we going next? We know we have a really good start, but we know there's so much more room to grow. Uh, we're definitely gonna be talking to our students for more ideas, but the few that we're starting with here in the next month uh, is our question and answer input tool. So even though it's easy to input questions into dialogue flow, it's not as quick if you have hundreds of questions to input at the same time. So we're writing, using dialogue flow APIs, we're writing a tool that will allow our departments to input hundreds of questions, and then our university marketing and communications will verify and approve each question and each answer. So it can all be streamlined, and we can have thousands of questions in our uh, chatbot up and running very quickly here in the next few months. So the next two editions uh, are all using the webhook. Uh, course information, just simply any type of uh, quick information about a course, so where is it, what day and time, uh, who's teaching, 
Uh, this is something our students asked for, so we're excited to put it in there. And finally, the shuttle routes. We don't want our students sitting at a shuttle stop waiting and waiting for a shuttle. So we're going to be putting in uh, where is my shuttle, when will the shuttle be at my stop, uh, which will save them a lot of time. Um, so with all of these examples and with all these additions, we are totally bringing information closer to the students. That way they can focus on things that are more important than just finding information. They can focus on their learning. With that, thank you, and I'd like to turn it over to Daniel McCarthy. He's going to tell you what they're doing at Strayer University. Good afternoon. The company I represent, Strategic Education, we actually have two, two universities. We have Strayer University and Cabela University. And our student population are primarily working adults. They uh, have jobs during the day. They, they come and do their coursework online in our learning, learning management system after, after hours. So I'm here to talk to you today about conversational self-service and what we've done at Strayer University. At Strayer, one of the problems we were trying to solve, or the problem we were trying to solve, was volume, variance, and availability. So we have working adults. They aren't typically able to make it into uh, the university or call the university during working hours. The, when they do make it in, or when they are able to call in, they may get bounced from department to department, and again, hold times, wait times. And then finally, we were getting more service requests than we had staff to, to support. So a chatbot's kind of a, a near perfect solution to a problem like that. A chatbot can be available at all times of the day, 24 hours a day. It can handle an infinite amount of scale. And trained properly, it can cross domain boundaries. If you think about this outside of the education industry, for example, just think about HR for a second. Within HR, you might have um, benefits management and then payroll. Those are two different domains with staff that are trained specifically for those domains. And you might have to be bounced from department to department. Our timeline for the initial release of our chatbot Irving, which was named after the founder of Strayer University, Irving Strayer, was very compressed. You'll see here roughly six months from idea to pilot to production and then scaling. What enabled this was a little bit of a perfect storm. So the, those developing this solution, myself included, had the domain experience for the domain that we were going to hit first, the technical experience, and then combining that with Dialogflow and GCP allowed us to move very quickly from an idea to a prototype to production. Now, we'll give you a little bit of a, a demo. Now, I apologize, I'm going to start and stop this a few times so that I can talk through it just a little bit. So, I've already stopped it. Isn't that disappointing? All right, so Irving is available in our student portal where almost all of our learners come. So, oh, thank you. All right, so uh, on, still going. All right, we're gonna go back here and do this again. All right, I'll talk a little bit before we play it. <laughs> Irving is available in the student portal online, the web application. We're piloting Google Assistant right now, and we're also piloting SMS. So meeting the students when they are and where they are. When they are, 24 hours a day, where they are, whatever platform that uh, they, they want to interact with. Some of those are a little bit easier than others. And now with that, we will 
play the demo. As students interact with Irving, it recognizes that if they've used Irving before. So you'll see here Holly, who is a learner that, that is interested in her academic progress and completion or progress towards graduation, has used Irving before. She wants to know what classes she has remaining. Irving goes into our back office SIS system and pulls up her program, how she's progressed through that program and what she has outstanding. Now, you'll see here as Holly asks about the syllabus for a course that she's already registered for, that she's using the title. And this ties into a little bit of what Greg was talking about with entities. So we can take the title of a course, we can take the course ID, and we can use those as synonyms and you'll, recognize, you'll see in the response that Dialogflow and Irving have recognized that critical thinking is synonymous with PHI 210. And in this case, Irving is giving the student to, uh, the link out to a, the course syllabus because would you ever deliver a course syllabus in a conversation in its entirety? No, you wanna keep things brief and conversational as you go through that. Now, Holly's concerned with her GPA, so again, we're gonna go into our back office system and pull up that GPA and see what she's got. This is a little verbose and may need a little bit of work regarding the response here, but Holly's doing all right with a 3.6 GPA, and she's in satisfactory standing both academically and financially. Now, Holly's asking about her grades. You'll notice that she didn't give a term. Schools are term-based, right? It doesn't matter semesters, trimesters, quarters, what have you, they're term-based. Irving has contextual awareness. We have set it up such that Irving assumes the most relevant term based on the time that the question is asked. But we're gonna go through it again here. And again, we have entities. Holly asks about grades for fall. But again, that's a little bit nebulous. Is it fall 18 or fall 19? Which one makes most sense? Again, contextual awareness allows us to know that we're talking about fall 18. And great job, Holly, for getting A's in, in both of your courses. Now, when am I gonna graduate? It's a hard projection, right? It's really based on student input. How, what are you going to put into it as a student? So Irving goes through and looks, calculates the average courses completed per term, and then asks Holly how many she's going to continue completing. And then we're, we're a quarter-based school, so how many quarters throughout the year are you planning to attend? And from that, Irving will then calculate a, an anticipated graduation date. And give the projection. And a little bit of legalese for those that require it. So now we'll talk a little bit about surveying. And you, you'll see here that Holly is saying thanks. And that's a little bit of an indication that the conversation is over, that the student, the user, has gotten what they want from the conversation, and that's rare. How many times have you guys been in a conversation with any chat, within any chat, and just left it when you got what you wanted? I have. And that, that's the, mo the more frequent case. You just leave the conversation. Like, I'm done, I got what I needed, no thank you or anything like that. Uh, so we survey at the time of uh, conversation conclusion. So when we recognize with a goodbye, with a thank you, or something along those lines, which is the rare occasion. The other time that we really survey is when we know that we have failed to understand the student. And that happens within Strayer when we have failed sequentially three times because we really try to understand as best we can, give them as many opportunities to, to let us help them with automation. But when we, when we fail them three times, we'll give them a survey and we will transition if we have availability to a human agent so that the human agent can continue that conversation and the human agent will receive the full transcript. But we're talking about surveys. So we, we survey more often when we know we failed than when we know we've been successful. And as we get into that, let's, we'll talk a little bit about those numbers and how that plays into the survey results. So we've had over 400,000 conversations with Irving. Over 80% of all chat requests are handled within Irving without transitioning to a live agent. This is where the surveys come in. 
Of those that have been surveyed by Irving, 87% agree that Irving helped them answer their questions easily. Now we've gotten some really good feedback and we've gotten some negative feedback in there as well. All constructive and will help us considerably to improve the Irving experience. So Greg talked a little bit, a little bit about it. Vanessa talked a little bit about it. Uh, intense. Intense are, you can think of those kind of as topical areas. We have 1,400 intents in production right now. Now, this, this, this chart is a bit of an eyesore, but I want you to think in terms of intents. This chart shows you over the past 30 days how our intents have been used by our student population. And look at that, you got 20 or 30 intents that are receiving the most volume. But you look on the right, the long tail, look at that. All other intents represent the majority of the questions that are answered. What, what, what you should take away from that is that the superb service with a chat bot, it's coming on the right. For all of those questions, they didn't have to go somewhere else to get an answer. They were able to get it within, even though the 20 to 30 there are the most frequently used. I'm gonna stop going backwards, I promise. So how do we do this? So this is going to be very similar to a, a typical software development life cycle. You gotta understand your use case. When you define your use case, be very granular. You want, you want to be as specific when you start any conversational experience as you possibly can. And then you need to gather data on that conversation. How do your students, how do your users ask about this topic? What parameters are they providing to it? What context are they giving? And then you need to script your conversations. And when you script your conversations, you start with a happy path. The happy path being how you want them to go through the conversation, but then you need to think about gracefully handling the fallout, the fallbacks, the, the, the branches of the conversation, and allowing for that, co that contextually. Then you're gonna start developing your integrations your SIS systems, your financial systems, your human resource systems, any system. And you're going to test those integrations with Dialogflow. Five, that's your most important step. You must pilot with your user population. If you do not pilot with your user population, you will get some very unpleasant surprises when you take this into any kind of production environment. We, we do this regularly at Strayer University and every time we learn something new, a new way that they ask about it that we haven't trained the, the bot on, or a new use case that we can then take back to number one and begin developing again. All right, so we've gone one through five, and now, now we're in production, we can all go home, we're done. It's not quite that simple. So when you're in production, you need to monitor your, your bot. You need to look for errors within your integrations and more importantly, fallbacks within your conversations. And fallbacks are when the bot can't understand what the users are sending to it. Because within those fallbacks, that's where you're going to find that long tail. What do they want to talk to your school about? That's going to, that is where you find this out. And then you're gonna keep repeating this until, until you're, you maybe run out of conversations to have, our experience is that you're likely not going to run out of conversations to have. How do we do this within uh, GCP? Well, Dialogflow is the system that we use for the intent detection and entity, entity extraction. Then we use cloud functions for fulfillment and conversation routing. We use Cloud SQL to record every interaction that we have within uh, Irving, on a nightly basis, we put that into BigQuery so that we can do some additional analysis. And we use Data Studio for the uh, reporting there. We use Compute Engine currently, although there was an announcement today that w may change that. We use Compute Engine to uh, host Redis so that we can do ca caching. And then we have a custom auto ML model that allows us to do fallback classification to better the experience. and. Since I am already out of time, anyone who wants to hear about that, we can follow up after. All of those components are put together 
here. And this, even this is a little bit high level on how we, we combined all of those components into an architecture that allows us to serve 1,400 different intents. And again, I'll be available for a little bit afterwards if you have questions on this. So where are we gonna go next? Well, this week we are launching at our sister university, Capella, we're launching Ella uh, in a uh, pilot phase. Very excited about that. We're also going to be increasing the personalization both within the integrations that we're developing and the ability to interject within conversations and maybe not even wait for a conversation to start. Now we're going to, next we're going to go into our learning management system where our students spend the majority of their time to assist them in the classroom experience. Completing assignments, writing assistance, maybe even quizzes. And then finally, phone system integration. So the press one for the first circle of hell, press two for the second circle of hell. We're going to replace that with an integration with Irving so that you can use natural language to uh, better the experience. And with that, I'll hand it over to Neil Gomes and he can talk to you about their experience at Thomas Jefferson. I'm gonna be talking to you about the value of chatbots in the medical space, both for medical and uh, education, as well as, uh, you know, actually maybe at some point in the future, <laughs> seeing a chatbot as your doctor. <laughs> sure everybody will like that. No? No? I see some, I see some faces saying no. <laughs> okay. Just you wait, you know. <laughs> Maybe at some Google Next, you know, we'll be laughing at this and saying, hey, you know, I said that you'd see a chatbot as a doc. Okay, all right. Well, so what I wanted to impress upon you today is, um, is really the power of conversation. So uh, I'm going to ask you a quick question, okay? And the answer is not iOS, it's not Android, it's not Windows, it's not Chrome. <laughs> what is the best operating system that we currently understand really well? What's that? Brain. The brain? Uh, not really, we don't really, I, I can't tell what's happening in your brain right now. <laughs> but. What, what else, yeah? Language, conversation, you know, the cue is right there. Okay. <laughs> there isn't much of a learning curve, right? And uh, uh, you, you, don't, you don't need to teach somebody how to speak. You're usually at, after the age of, in my, ki my kid's case, uh, 0.5, uh, <laughs> they, they know how to, how to converse. And, um, and so, um, so I think uh, we've been sitting on this for a long time and haven't really started leveraging it. It's really, really powerful, you know, and being able to get machines to start engaging in conversation is actually a huge leap for us in terms of, uh, you know, human development. Um, so, uh, so I think that's really important and we need to understand that. Uh, and I work, uh, I founded this group called the DICE Group, or the Digital Innovation and Consumer Experience Group at Thomas Jefferson University and Jefferson Health, where we bring digital to life. That's our motto. <laughs> All right. And so we've, we've, been, we've been doing a lot of work in the chatbot space that I'll talk to you about in a bit. But to give you some context, uh, this is who we are. Uh, Thomas Jefferson University is the third or fourth medical school in the nation, almost a 200-year-old institution. Uh, if you've heard of terms like gross anatomy, Samuel Gross was a Jefferson physician uh, who started gross anatomy. Uh, the heart-lung machine was invented at Jefferson. And we have about 15 hospitals now. Uh, we've been in rapid growth kind of uh, phase uh, mode. And, um, and, and, and on a revenue of about five and a half billion at this point. But uh, the most important figures to us are really those patients. You know, we see about 3.2 million patients a uh, year in our outpatient clinics, uh, about 150,000 in our hospitals, and uh, about 550,000 in our ERs. Okay, so, and we have about 8,000 students. So uh, a lot of impact through some of the solutions that we create as a group. Um, our team is about 220 people. Uh, we've grown from about two when we started <laughs> four, year, four and a half years ago. Um, uh, these are people that are software developers. Uh, Rob, who's sitting in the front here, runs our software development team. Um, and uh, we have about 70 or so software developers. We have designers, human-centered designers, about 40 of them, uh, that take uh, 
solutions that come to us and then find what the real problem is, and only then do we develop a solution, okay? Uh, and we develop several different types of solutions like this, about 130 a year, and return about 10x, which is something I learned about at Google uh, last year, uh, <laughs> in terms of returns on most of our projects, because we do things uh, uh, very frugally. Uh, very frugal innovation. Uh, and, and we return a lot of value to the organization. Just on our digital solutions, we save the organization over $40 million or so per year and have done a bunch of other things. And sometimes you'd be surprised at what generates value. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing. Uh, our donation app generated about $1.46 million just last month. So <laughs> and we never thought that would happen. Um, what we do with digital is we improve access, uh, make it convenient to get to us or for us to get to somebody else uh, where they are, that's always better, and then provide closed loop digital experiences which is very rare in the healthcare space. So, uh, so we try to do that. And chatbots and, and such types of tools, voice chatbots also enable you to do that and I'll give you a quick example. So voice bots, right? Powered by Google Dialogflow. We'll be talking about this on Thursday. Rob's going to do the presentation. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, we felt that there was tremendous value to our patients if we were able to answer any of their questions at any time while they're in the hospital room, even though there was no nurse available or no physician available. So we made a hospital room chatbot. Right, and, uh, and it's voice. Uh, we, we got a speaker system that really worked. We experimented with a lot of different types of speakers. Um, you know, people stole a lot of our speakers. Uh, <laughs> speaker cables <laughs> disappeared. And then we came down to this uh, particular form factor with a company that we work with. And um, uh, it, it tells you a lot of things. You know, it tells you when your meal might be coming, who your doctor is, uh, whether they are board certified or not. <laughs> it will tell you, uh, uh, you know, about your disease or condition. Um, it will it'll give you your discharge instructions if you're leaving and narrate them out to you from the EMR. Uh, it will control your TV. Uh, we have uh, mostly Samsung smart TVs, and so it controls. We've found a channel to do that. It controls your TV, changes the volume, all of that. Lighting. Uh, we can also have it control HVAC through our building automation systems, all just through voice. Um, so that's, that's our voice bots. Uh, we found that you know, people that uh, agree to do clinical research, they hate the surveys. <laughs> right? I mean, they're long things. They lie to you at the beginning and say this will be over in five minutes, but it doesn't <laughs> get over in five minutes. But they'd rather engage in conversations, sometimes even with a chatbot. So we made some research chatbots for our researchers. And we, uh, we have the service available to them to use anytime they want. Uh, we are now experimenting with the differential diagnosis chatbot. You know, differential diagnosis is, uh, you know, whenever you're doc, you go to the ER and the doc says, or the primary care and the doc says, I'll be right back. They're going to check their differential diagnosis tool. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Sometimes that's called Google, uh, but uh, there are actual tools uh, that, that they check uh, that give them um, uh, you know, they, they put in your condition, uh, your presenting conditions, um, you know, what, what, what it seems like you might, uh, uh, not conditions really, but symptoms. And then it gives them potential conditions with, um, uh, you know, with probabilities next to that. And it's very, very important because sometimes you might miss something, like Lyme disease, for example, you know, which presents in a very kind of uh, simple way you know, in an ER many times. And you might just forget to ask that other question, like, were you in the woods recently? You know, uh, did you get a tick bite? You know, those types of things. So it prompts docs to ask these types of questions. And it's an extremely useful tool for learning for residents and students because sometimes they just don't realize they've got to ask that question. So they go and do this, you know. What if we could present that as a chatbot? Almost, you know, in simple, quick, and easy ways, right? Especially because chatbots have these, the capability to present canned responses that they just tap on versus having to type something in, right? So, so that's what we are we're experimenting with, with a company called Isabel that, that creates a great differential diagnosis tool that's named after the person's, the, the CEO's daughter who passed away because you know, a good differential diagnosis tool was not used. Um, so we also created a, uh, along with, a, with one of our students, uh, once created a, um, uh, a compendium of all medical school notes. Okay, so came up with this brilliant idea, got permission from 
you know, the, the faculty uh, and, their, and their teachers, and, and they said, it's fine to do it. So they made like a Wikipedia of all medical school notes. And so now we're building chatbots on top of that uh, because we have a, a huge data source to mine. Um, we also are, this is very inspiring to see both examples of student experience chatbots. So this is uh, a space we, we really, really want to get into. Um, we've, we've done some of these things for patients, but uh, not yet in the student space. So that's something we want to build. We've also just deployed recently appointment chatbots, uh, the Rothman Institute, which is part of Jefferson, one of the best orthopedic uh, hospitals in, in the nation, um, now only takes online appointments through a chatbot. Okay, 24-7. They do have a phone number you can call, but any online appointments, there's no form. You just do it via chatbot. Okay, so, uh, and, and they're seeing great engagement and very fast, uh, you know, uh, information collection. And finally, um, a topic that, uh, you know, in the future we're probably going to have to deal with, and we are doing this right now, is a lot of people, especially institutions like us, um, are investing in um, robotic process automation, right, RPA, uh, in the financial side, um, in um, sometimes even in clinical, deep clinical areas uh, that have things that happen on the back end. And uh, we like to call these Autobots because this is, you know, pointed at uh, automation uh, and automation platforms. And, um, and, and we think there's great scope here because a lot of people that are in the operational spaces don't understand how these things work. And the bots could provide that insight. You know, the bots could also initiate the next action. You know, if you build the right type of platform, you know, you can, you can do some of these things transitionary elements, you know, really, really effectively using bots, we think. Because when we go into clinical areas and we try to, with our design teams, and we try to make them more efficient, we find that most latency and most issues with service happen when something transitions from one person to another. So now we're starting to automate some of those transitions, right? But some of them are still human. So if you want somebody to respond, you know, you have a bot in between that initiates that next step. You know, either via a text message or, you know, via a platform that you might have across the system. So, you know, make things happen a lot faster, which in medicine is very important. Time is life many times.